Hello, I'm Selena Osuna, the coordinator for the Institute for Humanities Research and assistant director of Desert Humanities. It's my pleasure to welcome y'all to the second event of our Elemental Speaker Series, where today we're delighted to be in conversation with Dr. Jada Aj. Before we get started, I'd like to extend gratitude to those who've made this event possible. Thank you to our behind the scenes moderators today, Lauren Whitby, IHR Communications Specialist Senior, Liz Grumbach, Assistant Director of the IHR, and Ron Brolio, Assist Associate Director of the IHR and Director of Desert Humanities. Thanks also to Joe Carter of Livestream Success, who's running our streams today. You may have noticed that the chat has been disabled on Zoom. Please feel free to ask questions for our speaker at any time by using the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom window or by commenting on YouTube. And our moderators will relay them to our host today. The Desert Humanities Initiative at ASU is a shared endeavor to think and practice with one another in ways that honor desert places. This series in particular has a focus on the elemental, the biological and geological representations of time, distance, and humanity that are so pronounced in desert environments. One example is the saguaro cacti of the Sonoran Desert, which in their lifetime of over 100 years bear witness to several human generations. Another example is the fact that the Rocky Mountains formed somewhere between 80 million to 55 million years ago, and in their most recent memories have witnessed indigenous peoples who hunted ancient bison and mammoths, as well as conquistadors, and now millions of tourists. But today is about sand, water, salt, and literature. It's an absolute honor for me to welcome Dr. Jada Aj, who joined ASU last fall and is a lecturer for the Faculty of Leadership and Integrative Studies at ASU, where she teaches courses in liberal and interdisciplinary studies. She's the author of Sand, Water, Salt, Managing the Elements in Literature of the American West, 1880 to 1925, which we'll get to hear more about today and which is out in January. Jada is also the co-editor of Reading Aridity in, in Western American Literature, which is out this December. Thank you, Jada, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Selena. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So I definitely want to thank Ron, Selena, and the Desert Humanities Initiative for organizing this series of talks. Selena, when you told me that y'all were planning a series based on the elements, I was absolutely thrilled. So thank you for bringing me into the conversation. It's one that I'm delighted to participate in. I thought I'd start by reading a few excerpts from my book, Sandwater Salt, which will be available from Texas Tech University Press in December. On the current slide, you can see the table of contents. But I often just refer to chapters two through four as the sand, water, and salt chapters. The book takes an elemental approach to thinking about scientific land management at the turn of the 20th century, and each chapter focuses on the radical nature of what some progressive era individuals considered, considered a wasteland material in the American West. Management is the guiding theme of this project. Each chapter focuses on land management as a series of intimate human environmental engagements in the context of American territorial expansion, trans-Pacific trade and travel, water development, the formation of national parks, scientific surveying, and forced removals of indigenous peoples from ancestral lands. Management, as I define it, not only refers to top-down efforts to regulate difficult or so-called unproductive environments, but it also denotes human attempts to manage in harsh ecologies as laborers, rangers, supervisors, natural scientists, travelers, or exiles. As eco-critic Tom Lynch says of human environmental relations, there is only and always engagement, only and always intimacy. Try as we might, we can never manage our way out of elemental enmeshment. This book started as my dissertation, so I've been living with it for about eight or nine years now. At times, I felt stuck in quicksand while writing it, and at other more productive stages of the writing process, I felt like I was being swept along by a sandstorm. I'm not quite sure that I'm out of the sandstorm just yet since I'm reading proof, but soon maybe. Today, I plan to share part of the introduction outline some of the material stakes of the book. And since this series is being hosted by Desert Humanities, I thought I'd read part of the sand chapter, which focuses on the power of what I call queer sand in works by Frank Norris and Mary Austin. In Claire Vade Watkins' 2015 cli-fi novel, Gold Fame Citrus, 
the American West has run out of water. Depleted aquifers, dried up rivers, prolonged drought, drain reservoirs, snowless mountaintops, and in general, the breakdown of human engineered landscapes trigger a mass exodus of individuals heading east in search of greener, more accommodating terrain. Watkins' story begins in Southern California, the heart of the failed experiment, just a few years after the region ultimately succumbs to salt and infinite sand. In the apocalyptic passage that follows, the narrator breathlessly summarizes some of the many ecological disasters that contributed to the collapse of industries, municipalities, and infrastructures in the arid and semi-arid West. The Central Valley went salt flat as its farm crops regularly drilled 3,000 feet into the unyielding earth, praying for aquifer, but delivered only hot brine. As Mohaves sucked up the groundwater to Texas, as a major tendril of interstate collapsed into a mile-wide sinkhole, killing everybody on it. As all of the Southwest went moonscape with sinkage, as the winds came and as Phoenix burned, and as a white hot super doom entombed Las Vegas. This bleak vision of the Southwest set in the not too distant future is scarily alive with sandy, briny, and altogether animated environmental elements. Elements that kill humans, squash their desires, and entomb entire metropolitan areas with what seems a blind indifference. The gone water, as the narrator calls the now absent element, ha haunts the novel's dusty, contaminated landscape. Humans could never manage in this, quote, deadest place on the planet, readers might assume. From a human perspective, Watkins' pavement-eating, city-smothering desert appears to orient itself towards death and destruction. In its aggressive rejection of human life, the novel's waterless west often comes off as the paradigmatic wasteland. If one lingers too long in its hostile sand and sweltering heat, they risk losing their life. However, gold fame citrus also complicates readers' understanding of arid environments by imbuing desert materialities with a throbbing and at times enchanting kind of vibrancy. The Amargosa Dunsi, a colossal ridge of ever accumulating sand between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, exists as a case in point. Even though the monstrous dune is capable of blanketing entire towns in a matter of hours, the narrator also informs us that the Amargosa holds a queer and curious energy, one that simultaneously attracts and vexes scientists, cartographers, and land management agencies. Still came the scientist, climatologist, geologist, volcanologist, soil experts, agriculturalist, horticulturalist, conservationist. Still came the BLM and EPA and NWS and USGS all assigned to determine why a process that ought to have taken 5,000 years had happened in 50, all tasked with determining how to stop the mountain's unrelenting, unrelenting march. All of them failed. The managers believed that scientific observation would lead to greater understanding of the dune's nature, which might allow them to develop more effective methods of control. However, despite their close surveillance, or perhaps, perhaps because of it, they could not halt the Amargosa's unrelenting march, the narrator concedes. In other words, proximity to environmental problems does not always render mastery, especially when mastery entails subduing dynamic ecologies. The managers experiment with a variety of tactics to combat the dune, including spraying it with oil and even storming it with bombs, but these efforts fail to quell its power. The sand does not relent. In addition to triggering diverse managerial, managerial responses from administrators, the ever-growing sea of sand also beckons the chosen and foments feelings of belonging amongst desert outcasts and refugees. According to the narrator, the Amargosa elicits a pole said to be far beyond topographic charm. It was chemical, pheromonal, elemental, a tingle in the ions of the brain, a tug in the iron of the blood. Individuals in the novel who feel this near alchemical pole often experience sand as a dynamic entity that moves through you and changes a person from the inside out. Far from barren, Watkins' arid futurescape contains energetic elements that do not fit easily into the categories of waste, natural resource, or remediable problem. While progressive style land management tends to read environmental matter as distant stuff whose value humans ascribe, the novel offers a more relational perspective on human elemental engagement. 
In Watkins' 21st century desert, elements intimately live into humans and, in doing so, refuse to let the human be. Sand, salt, and even water, when it finally does appear in the final pages, enter the skin, invade the airways, choke the throat, stimulate desire, and rather annoyingly, nestle in the armpits and ass crack, to quote Watkins, resulting in recurrent managerial responses at multiple scales. While characters can easily snap the infinite sand from the bed sheets, they cannot prevent the giant dune from heading westward in their direction. Goldfade and citrus reflects many of our own anxieties in the era of global climate change. In these opening pages, I refer to just a few of the novel's restless, sand-stirred moments because they call on us to consider the complicated legacies of scientific land management in the American West and beyond. Sandwater Salt tracks the impacts of these legacies via close readings of progressive era fiction, technical literature, indigenous autobiography, irrigation maps, National Park Foundation documents, aerial photographs, and other literary and non-literary text. This diverse archive reveals how environmental elements do something outside of remaining under control. Often, the radical doings of sand, water, and salt test the authority of what Martha Banta refers to as turn-of-the-century management culture, leaving us with a vision of administrative networks that are as unstable as they are pervasive. For instance, even though water is scarce in Owen Wister's, be Owen Wister's best-selling Western novel, The Virginian, which would seem to put humans and their water-dependent agricultural industries at risk, that same scarcity also amplifies the power of those who own the land or have the means to finance and supervise water diversion projects, namely the ranchers and developers. Administrative power then, as I define it in this talk, relies upon the same elemental uncertainty that threatens that power, making land management a clearly recursive enterprise. This vision of loopy management or of controlling by slightly failing to control, provides environmental humanists with a counter narrative to more top-down despotic depictions of progressive era land management, such as we see in popular environmental histories like Donald Worcester's Rivers, Rivers of Empire or Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert, to name just a few. Instead of reading management as an all-consuming, highly abstract network of imperial power, which has the effect of severing humans from environments, the queer, messy, altogether interactionist vision of human ecological relations I call attention to here casts management in more porous, albeit still powerful terms. For even though administrative failure tends to stimulate the messy reproduction of the progressive management apparatus, allowing its operational networks to sprawl and not infrequently fortify, those same failures also open up spaces and moments wherein environmental justice activism and resilience might be possible. The ecological and managerial failures Watkins vividly portrays in her novel, the salty ditches, empty reservoirs, crumbling aqueducts, and deteriorating dams, find their root in what historian Thomas C. Leonard refers to as progressives of extravagant faith in administration. Through an examination of the eco-materials humans set out to manage in the arid, semi-arid, and oceanic west, sandwater salt traces the contours of that faith while also shining a light on the elemental incidents that breach that faith. Even though gold fame citrus takes place in the 21st century and therefore seems far removed from popular turn of the century depictions of the West as a clean blank page, prominent progressive era figures haunt both the structure and setting of the novel, demonstrating that history, unlike water, does not easily evaporate in the desert. For example, William Maholland, the engineer who, as his obituary reads, almost single-handedly and against bitter opposition, designed and supervised the Los Angeles aqueduct, visits Watkins' main character in a dream. The ambitious engineer also emerges in epigraph form at the beginning of book one with his famous words, go ahead, take it, and thus reminds readers of the initial cascade of diverted Owens River water that stimulated development, development in Los Angeles and the surrounding Southern California region. At the beginning of book two, Watkins quotes a different kind of turn of the century figure in the epigraph, nature writer and preservationist Mary Austin, whose work I will discuss later in this talk. When the words of these Western progressives appear at the beginning of distinct sections of gold fame citrus, they interrupt the novel's chronology, forcing readers to consider how the environmental reforms of the past 
continue to impact Western lands to this day. Watkins' resurrection of these and other turn-of-the-century engineers, preservationists, federal managers, irrigation enthusiasts, and naturalists collapses time, ma making it difficult to distinguish the idealism of the past from what some eco-critics consider the melancholia of the present. Though long dead, these reformers live on in the West via the vast networks of dams, highways, national parks, and other humanized landscapes they help build and promote. Western eco-materials hold on to these legacies as well. In other words, the sand, water, and salt are rich in story. It is important for eco-critics to heed the implicit call in gold fame citrus to reevaluate the progressive era's environmental and managerial legacy. One way we can do that is by examining moments in literature when dynamic non-human materials challenge, frustrate, resist, or disobey administrative control in the American West and elsewhere. In the diverse progress narratives I analyze in this project, management often imagines that it can achieve mastery over the environment. However, when we read such narratives through the lens of material and elemental eco-criticism, such as that promoted by Cohen and Duckert, who spoke as part of this series last week, we discover that managers fail more often than they like to admit. These recurrent failures often strengthen administrative and bureaucratic processes. After all, recurrent problems require innovative, often intensive responses, thus justifying the manager's continued presence. However, I contend that they, also might, that they might also invite possibilities for more compassionate ways of managing land and oceans in the, in the Anthropocene. Sandwater Salt investigates managerial engagements with animated elements in three particular Western environments, the arid deserts, the semi-arid high plains, and the Pacific Ocean. At different times and to varying degrees, Americans have deemed these environments economically unproductive, incompatible with Euro-American settlement, or highly unmanageable. Despite these varied complaints, the United States has also intensely desired these wasteland spaces, perceiving them as sources of both national wealth and elite pleasure. Wasteland rhetoric has long been deployed in order to justify resource extraction, development, and the removal of indigenous communities problems that continue to plague Western American regions to this day. When, when trying to justify the construction of his border wall along the US-Mexico border, for example, Donald J. Trump has described the biologically and culturally complex desert environment as near empty space, which has the effect of draining the arid lands of their human and non-human presences. In the chapters that follow, I will argue that progressive era managers frequently deployed the same kind of rhetoric in order to appropriate valuable territory. However, the elements that comprise those, quote, empty spaces have a way of engendering unanticipated forms and interrupting the manager's plans. It is worth pursuing those elemental eruptions and frustrations in the Western United States, where exists the vast majority of the nation's publicly managed lands. The three elements I've chosen to examine, sand, water, and salt, emblematize the three environments this eco-critical project treats. Turn of the century writers depict these elements quite provocatively in their writings, imbuing them with a kind of liveliness that equals and at times even exceeds that of animals and humans. In their excess, scarcity, mobility, and obstinacy, sand, water, and salt exist as management problems in many progressive era works set in the American West. Characters in these works regularly struggle when exposed to the elements. After all, such elements are capable of chiseling the skin, invading the nasal passages, flooding the lungs, and even drying the blood. Though often relegated as waste elements in these works due to their failure to achieve valuable commodity status, these lively eco-materials exhibit diverse methods of entering human lives, bodies, and policies. In other words, sand, water, and salt matter, but they do so queerly and often entrancingly, as the writings of Yone Noguchi, Mary Austin, Sarah Wenemucca, and others demonstrate most clearly. Furthermore, I argue that critical meditations on human elemental engagements, particularly in the West, a region that popular culture frequently regards as an intensely white masculine space, force us to reconsider romantic representations of the rugged individualist, who because of his hard and impermeable body, is depicted as supremely mastering the disobedient region. The ethical code of the Western, says Jane Tompkins, puts adult white males on top with everyone else in descending order beneath. 
According to the code, it seems even the environment itself falls beneath and therefore exists apart from the heroic white male body. However, when we track sand, water, and salt in turn of the century works set in Western wastelands, we begin to see that eco-materials unendingly penetrate bodies, even tough and manly ones, such as Wister's Virginian, revealing an interconnected bio-collective vision of the West. Other waste materials like wildfire smoke, cyanobacteria, uranium tailings, cow dung, insecticide, etc., would make compelling material for future elemental studies. Perhaps environmental humanists will investigate further these and other eco-materials that sandwater salt overlooks. Part of my aim in the book is to seek out management practices that are committed to environmental justice, non-human compassion, and what Stacey Alimo refers to as elemental love in the Anthropocene. How can we manage with love? And what would the tools and outcomes of such a management style be? What would land management look like if it radically embraced risk, encouraged shared governance, and engaged with the elements not as threats, but as mutual stakeholders in environmental decision-making? And what might it mean to manage without mastery? Literature provides a rich archive for observing and evaluating the diverse ways that humans and environmental matter have emotionally and physically touched, moved, and transformed one another. By building new literary and cultural archives that orbit around the theme of land management, we might also begin to develop and strengthen interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary communities that are invested in developing more ecologically attuned approaches to land management and activism. It is easy to overlook sand, water, and salt in both literature and in our daily lives. We might think of these elements when we think of them at all in largely economic terms as passive matter that achieves value via the marketplace. At other more immersive moments, these elements might strike us as nuisance materials, such as when sand blows into our eyes or rainwater leaks into our homes. Unless we contemplate these elements for more than a few seconds, we might perceive them as dead and discrete particles. A drop of water is just a drop of water. Instead of as highly mobile members of hyper-objective assemblages in their own right. I want to encourage environmental humanists to give into the pool, as Watkin calls it, of sand, water, and salt in progressive era American literature. When we imaginative, imaginatively surrender to the pole, we gain the powerful ability to see wasteland for what it is, a capitalistic concept that rhetorically deadens environments and in turn rationalizes extractive industrial practices. Even in the desiccated West, Watkins imagines in gold famed citrus, readers discover moments of strange liveliness and even possibility. But there is life here, one character says, as the sand continues its steady march in the distance. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There is so much life. I'll now jump ahead to chapter two, which I refer to as the sand chapter. This chapter explores the irritatingly seductive, somewhat deviant nature of 19th century American desert ecologies, with a particular emphasis on the animacy of sand in Frank Norris's McTeague and Mary Austin's The Land of Little Rain which were published just four years apart. Today, however, I will only briefly explore Sand and Austin's work. At once oppressive and radiant with the color of romance, the sand, sun, and wind in Norris's desert, much like the material forces at play in Austin's writing, generate an embodied discourse that both supports and thwarts characters' ability to manage in the arid lands of Southern California. As one of the desert's many queer actants, the elemental amalgamation that we call sand operates as a metonym for arid geographies, and in turn of the century desert literature is the material that emerges most frequently to identify a region as a desert region. Far from a manageable geography, the anti-pastoral lands of Southern California and Western Nevada, as they are presented in these progressive works, are alive with eco-matter that elicits what Heather Sullivan calls material environmental immersion. Our survival on earth, Sullivan says, depends on our full immersion into our earthy, bacteria-laden surroundings. Furthermore, Sullivan contends that the challenge of shaping dirt and negotiating with its mobile grit functions as a metaphor for the project of modernity. As a character in Edna Aiken's 1914 novel, The River Notes of the sand that perpetually invades her Southern California home, there's no use in trying to be clean, but that doesn't stop her from deliriously trying. 
desiring a control over, over dirt through the institu institutionalization of various sanitation and waste management projects, progressives sought to overcome or at least mitigate human engagements with the sticky, gritty stuff of their modern environments. In addition to the spread of local anti-dirt campaigns and spotless town campaigns, such as the prompting, promptings by the Phoenix Vigilance Committee to quote, erect barriers against dirt and insanitation, federal engineers and land managers were often charged with the messy task of building a nation on a foundation of itinerant grounds composed of mud, erosive rock, and sand. If, as Nicholas Weechi argues, the West exists as the raw material of the American imaginary, what role does the region's raw materiality play in that national project? As a response to that question, I argue that in, that in America's arid desert spaces, the mobile grit that is sand at once tested and engendered a progressive vision of modernity. In other words, management likes to think its success depends on securing impervious boundaries between humans and the wily elements, that working against instead of with the land safeguards the longevity of administrative authority. However, management's enduring power in the arid West instead seems to derive from its unending, radically intimate engagements with animated eco-matter. This is not to say that Sand's only role is to merely solidify the progressive project in the American West. In addition to energizing the, the administrative apparatus, both Norris and Austin reveal that Sand can occasionally undermine or hinder human attempts to manage altogether, imbuing the element with a vitality that can, quote, never be predicted or controlled. And I also want to add here that in chapter three, I argue that for Sarah Winnemucca, sand, particularly when it's stirred up by settler migrations, comes to signify white encroachment on indigenous lands, colonial violence, and in general, environmental and cultural disruption. In several scenes, sandstorms elicit feelings of loss and trauma for Winnemucca and other Paiutes, and I'm happy to talk, discuss that chapter in more detail during the Q&A um, and talk about the connections between them. Elizabeth Gross refers to moments of potentiality when bodies and as things encounter one another and experience ontological conversion as zones of cohesion or a kind of queer commingling of subjects and objects wherein sensations are both exchanged and shared. Scientific land management then does not merely assert its power from above, and nor does it affect change upon the landscape from a safe and separate realm. Instead, it exists as a series of desires for control, for power, for distance, for understanding, born from its sticky relationships with indeterminate, frustrating, and vibratory matter. To state it in more granular terms, individuals will manage sand so long as sand remains a problem. Management is a confession that one is inextricably mired in vibrant sand. A queer and aggravating kind of desert desire then is central to this turn of the century management project in the Southwest. In McTeague and Land of Little Rain, characters become saturated with the elements, to use Austin's word, words and land, an act that registers not only as a kind of radical openness to eco matter, but also as an irritant to the management apparatus in general. After all, saturation signifies porous boundaries and a watering down of the body. In contrast, management prefers its bodies watertight, nimble, and machine-like. While McTeague tries hard and then fails to prevent the inevitability of elemental saturation, Austin seems to invite permeation, understanding it as a way for outsiders to connect intimately with place. Contrasting herself with prospectors who develop a, quote, weather shell that prevents the dust-heavy winds from, from penetrating and hence further altering their forms, Austin admits that as a relative newcomer to the San Joaquin Valley, she can never get past the glow and acceleration of a sandstorm. Her inability to keep sand at a physical and emotional distance mesmerizes her, prompting her to write enthusiastically of desertness as a way of understanding the new region she found herself in. Austin's ecocentric approach to, to desert writing, in particular, her emphasis on the liveliness of desert actants like sand and wind reflects a nuanced management style that remains open and alert to what she refers to as environmental tricksiness and ontological difference. To that end, in the first chapter of Land, she states, desert is a loose term to indicate land that supports no man. However, in the very next sentence, she counters the assumption that the desert is altogether lifeless by affirming, void of life it never is, however dry the air and villainous the soil. 
For Austin, life is not synonymous with human life, and the West is not merely a passive landscape that awaits settlement and development, as irrigationist William E. Smythe described it in 1900. In other words, just because fewer humans occupy the 19th century American desert than they might greener regions of the country does not mean that other forms of life and liveliness, like animals, xerophilic biota, and grains of sand, fail to matter there. In fact, what she, when she describes the soil as villainous, she grants the element a kind of radical agency, inferring that its rejection of Eastern agriculture is a choice and not a sign of voided life. To substantiate these life claims, Austin gets down to the eye level of rat and squirrel kind to observe mouse trails, wild oats, and the efflorescence of alkaline deposits. In repositioning the narrative eye from human height to rodent level, she invites readers to shift their attention to desert beings and phenomena that might go unnoticed by less observant passers-by. Additionally, when she tells us that she, the so-called desert wise manager, makes a deliberate point to kneel and observe, she attempts to render herself as a more attuned desert lover, one whose knees and hands press into the sand as she lowers her head to listen. Austin's proximity to the desert floor in this scene attempts to communicate to readers that she is the one who knows, and she knows by sight, sound, and touch. In Land's introductory chapter, Austin's willingness to observe close up leads her to write an entire paragraph detailing the mysterious nature of sailing traces that oddly shimmer in the interstices of roving sand dunes, a description that imbues the desert with the queer energy that at once moves her and moves through her, pleasurably and unmanageably so. Not only does Austin press into the desert floor on hands and knees, but its force presses back. And unlike resistant McTeague, she seems to take pleasure in becoming sand. Time and again, Austin appears captivated by the transmutable potential of the desert, describing it as a quote, working evasive something that has, to, has the power to come leaping out at me in odd contradictions of the accepted way of waking intelligence. Instead of turning away from the desert's unpredictable energy, or of struggling to prevent the desertifying elements from invading her body, Austin expresses fascination with Sand's ability to vampirically fasten onto her vitals and take her in. Managers and environments engage in ongoing material exchanges, and in land, Austin seems open to exploring the possibilities of that mutual fastening. For her, Sand operates as a strange substance that gives the surveilling manager observer pause making her reflect on the animacy of regulated matter. Sand is matter, but it is unstable matter. It is made of rock, but it often behaves like air and water. In several scenes, Sand tests the manager's belief that there are only active humans encountering passive matter. Dust devils dance, whirling up into a wide pale sky. Airborne sand moves along the backs of the crawling cattle. Dust heavy winds wrestle during a storm. Blown sand fills and fills about the lower branches of a mesquite, and little flakes of whiteness flutter and cloud Austin's vision. Never quite still, sand trespasses into private property and personal space, touching the bodies that reside there, both emotionally and physically. Austin sand operates as a collective body, each grain coordinating with all the others to elicit amazement and frustration in human and animal bystanders. In Austin's writing, the desert is an ongoing experience and its sensor sensory dimensionality, its diverse flavors and tingling textures, time slows, complicates, and deepens rather than economizes. The atmosphere of Austin's desert weighs heavy with bitter dust. And within that dust cloud, time decelerates, expands, and frequently arouses. Therefore, when Austin gets lost in the desert's golden dust for entire paragraphs and reads into the deep time of desert geology, she indulges in more than mere narrative fancy. Instead, these detailed passages slow time and in consequence present readers with an alternative temporal logic, one that enlivens matter rather than directing it towards productive ends. In one moment, she observes that the sculpture of the hills here is more wind than waterwork, though the quick storms do sometimes scar them, and thus invites readers to contemplate the slow, unintentional interactions between wind and rock that over time have given shape to the region. Such passages encourage readers to look back into the deep past, to be with the hill as it formed over the course of millennia, before arriving once again at the past-infused present. 
Rebecca McWilliams Evans argues that to criticize progress is necessarily both a narrative and temporal action. And I read Austin's attunement to sand and other geologic materials as a kind of environmental stance, one that attempts to challenge a politics of perpetual improvement. In other words, Austin seems to be calling for a way of reading the natural sciences through a literary lens, or what we might today refer to as the slow scholarship of the environmental humanities. Whether it clouds or distorts vision with its windless blur, or vibrates in queer color waves across the vast expanse, the sand that these early progressive writers marvel at in their writing thwarts our desire for conceptual and practical mastery, to use the words of Jane, Jane Bennett, and this refusal angers us, but it often also offers an ethical injunction. The ethical injunction Bennett speaks of is an acknowledgement of the thing power of the objects and substances that both surround and enter us, a recognition that environmental forces are engaged in a series of doings. Even though humans use materials such as sand for a variety of industrial purposes, which would seem to place humans at the top of a hierarchy of entities, the waste produced by these ongoing extractive practices often creates newer and bigger pro problems for management to tackle. Nuclear waste, from both the front end and back end, is but one example of management's inability to manage and manage in its own aftermath. How then might a slow focus on sand and literary scholarship help shed some light on management's complicated, seeming unending relationship with waste in contemporary desert spaces? especially since the desert is where we often bury things. And what role can the humanities play in responding to waste, particularly radioactive waste, which often gets discarded or left to scatter in desert sand? If, as Austin says, the desert soil keeps the impression of any continuous treading, even after grass has overgrown it, what temporal strategies might environmental humanists employ in their scholarship to grapple with the longevity of that impression? Sand and wind are particularly energetic in Austin's collection of nature essays, and it is here where her writing holds the most relevance for humanists, particularly those invested in issues related to the energy humanities, environmental justice, and nuclear ontologies. Just as Austin's sand cakes in the nostrils and drifts in the lee of every shrub, so too do flecks of dangerous substances merge with and, in a sense, become sand in contemporary desert spaces. What exactly are we witnessing when we observe a sandstorm? The answer to this question might seem simple, but what we generically refer to as sand, especially when seen from a distance, is actually an amalgamation of a whole host of particles that are both harmless and at times injurious. Small bits of rock, crushed animal bones, pollen, rust from old cars, specks of house paint, desiccated fecal matter, human hair, dog fur, copper tailings, alkali dust, dried grass, insects, etc. The definition of sand varies, and its composition depends on a location's geological, ecological, and cultural past. Composed largely of mineral particles, such as silica and calcium carbonate, sand is strange in that it combines and travels with small bits of other ecomaterials, even stirred up specks of an environment's to toxic signature, like glyphosate and uranium dust. In Goldfame Citrus, Watkins highlights the queer nature of contemporary desert sand in the Southwest when one of her characters observes a sand dune that glowed radioactive with light due to its toxic makeup, which included fertilizer dust and saline particulate. Even when these dust-like industrial particles are managed and contained, they hardly ever lay waste, but are perpetually exposed by erosion and stirred up by winds, entering the mouths, ears, and skin of all who enter the region. <clears throat> While Austin does not directly refer to toxic materiality in land, her understanding of the way sand moves through bodies and time offers a paradigm through which we can think more creatively and narratively about the agential waste materials populating what some call the tainted desert. After all, the longer some of these materials like uranium hang around, the more we become them which has the effect of transforming time into a precariously embodied experience. Between 1944 and 1986, mining companies extracted close to 300 tons of uranium ore under leases with the Navajo Nation. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency, 500 abandoned uranium mines exist on the reservations alone, on the reservation alone. Managing the cleanup and containment of those mines, 
particularly if they were open pit operations, is no easy task. Often the uranium tailings leach into springs and drinking water or get churned up by wind, leaving those who live in the region at risk of exposure. The half-life of uranium ranges from 25,000 to 4.5 billion years. Quick fix, progress-oriented management narratives struggle to encapsulate that pernicious and lingering hereness that is uranium waste. Radioactive contamination leaks into the deep futures and as such appears insolvable. Evan states that long-term environmental crises ask us to think across new scales of time. In other words, responding to environmental crisis requires the ability to reckon with slow, deep, and cyclical forms of non-human time. In its commitment to detailing the minuscule, as well as, its, as well as its attunement to the minuscule, to temporal, let me repeat that. In its commitment to detailing the minuscule, as well as its attunement to temporal layering and cyclical lifestyles, Austin's unhurried nature writing makes us think about the role slow narratives can play in thinking across new scales of time to address slow violence or the attritional impacts of environmental crises. Through both theme and structure, Austin advocates for slow time in land, and in doing so, she reveals how writers might employ decelerated temporalities as a political tool in their work. Management's directed spatiotemporal logic leaves little room for reflection, Austin argues. In its rush towards remediable features, administrative time refuses to pa pause long enough for us to contemplate the temporal drag that defines climate change, nuclear contamination, and other lingering and evolving ecological crises. Austin's description of a sinister something that lurks under the soil reminds us that long buried things, such as nuclear waste, have a way of bubbling to the surface and exerting their strange agency when we least expect them. In one passage, she says, a hidden force works mischief, mole-like, under the crust of the earth. Whatever agency is at work in that neighborhood, and it is popularly supposed to be the devil, it changes means and direction without time or season. It creeps up whole hillsides with insidious heat, unguessed until one notes the pine woods dying at the top. While Austin's devilish, mole-like something that creeps around in the earth, waiting for its moment to emerge and destroy, represents a natural force that takes on strange life in the desert. This weird energy resonates with the insidious nature of nuclear waste that dwells in and around abandoned mines and tailings piles in parts of the Southwest. I want to end by saying that the kinds of temporal frameworks that humanity scholars create and engage with when examining environmental themes in literature truly matter. In Mapping Common Ground, 10 environmental humanists from diverse fields outline what they describe as a slow approach to scholarship. They arrive at the conclusion that humanity scholarship is, by its very nature, slow to progress, and they view this unrushed methodology as a benefit to environmental scholarship. This emphasis on reflection and interpretation means that the humanities are, by their very nature, slow to progress, the article says, perhaps even incompatible with the very idea of progress. The skills of narration and of careful reading demand that we pay attention to text and context until we can reveal their deeper implications, ambiguities, and blind spots. This call to embrace slow scholarship in the environmental humanities does not mean we dismiss all appeals to urgent action, and nor does it require us to read progress in purely oppositional terms. Instead, it simply reminds us that the human dimension is inextricably meshed with the elemental, Reading sand and land is also reading the human that is sand, in other words. Just as individuals in Austin's land of little rain stroll ankle deep in shifty sands, unable to extricate themselves from the sticky element, so too are we up to our heads in the toxic things of our culture. Additionally, what we call industrial sand touches our lives in very literal ways, from our cell phones to concrete, and we find ourselves more than ankle deep in its materiality, regardless of where we live. By remaining focused on the trails of material operations that link wasteland elements to our homes, our daily habits, and our bodies, environmental humanists will be able to communicate the intimate proximity of such spaces to all of us, thus further eroding the myth that what happens out there, away from us, in the elemental waste, is not also happening within us. Austin's call for readers to observe, experience, and to a degree relinquish the hope of total control over sand gives visibility to today's circuits of unmanageable managed matter, allowing readers to think through new ways of living and managing in uncertain environments. 
Thank you. <laughs> Stop the sharing. Thank you for that, Dana. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. That was that was incredible. Thank you so much um, for sharing your work. I am particularly drawn to um, something that our first question deals with as well. Your notions that you're picking up about compassion and care of the land and in, in kind of sidestepping or undermining management, which humans don't even have to do, right? The elemental is doing that anyway. Um, and so the question we have, the first question we have for you is, thinking about care and compassion as management strategies feels very feminist and anti-racist as well, because um, you're queering the sand, right? Um, are the suggestions for us to approach land management with love related to these theoretical methodologies at all? Yeah, I would definitely think so. And what comes to mind when I think about managing with love um, would also be um, just finding ways to adopt indigenous approaches to management as well. Um, and there are a number of examples that um, in my project I try to respond to and um, the indigenous leadership initiative in Canada is one example <laughs> um, that I would maybe point to just as an example of what that might look like on the ground. Um, it's a pan-indigenous initiative um, and each community has their own guardian that deals with kind of land management issues. Um, and then all of the guardians, um, you know, throughout the year kind of come together and um, you know, try to develop strategies that are specific to um, that time in that community. Um, so I would say um, management, managing with love can take on a lot of different forms and it definitely draws from um, indigenous studies and feminist studies. Um, and I'm hoping that in the book and in the, in the presentation, um, the point was made that I don't, I mean, I, I think a lot of land, manager, land managers and rangers um, do already manage with love. I used to volunteer at a national park um, and the rangers who worked at that park um, cared deeply for the land that they were managing. Um, sometimes the policies um, that they were, you know, kind of working with um, didn't have that kind of attunement with the land that or that connection to the land that they felt <laughs> for it. Um, so I think that there's still some work there. Um, but I think really what we need is kind of a layering of different kinds of management. Um, Kind of the traditional you know scientific land management along with these other ways of connecting and becoming attuned to you know the lands that we care deeply about but yeah, i would say with, that it definitely draws from a lot of those you know kind of theories and histories that were commented on in the question thank you i think this is also very aligned to that um this next question uh could you speak a little bit about eco justice specifically um, which i feel is very connected to the work you're doing in this book project um, and then they also wanted to know if you could perhaps speak to what led you to this work. I have a feeling that your the job you just mentioned as park ranger might have something. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so the question of eco-justice um, is a question that throughout the book I keep returning to, and I definitely see um, eco-justice activism as being a kind of management. Um, it, throughout the book, I try to expand the definition of land management so that we see it as more than just, you know, the ranger wearing the suit, you know, strolling through the lands and, you know, taking care of it and being the protector. Um, but I think anybody who feels, you know, deeply for um, the environment and especially the places that they're from um, are managing in their own way. Um, and I would point to, um, you know, a lot of the folks on the Navajo reservation who are doing, you know, kind of anti-nuclear um, activism and also, you know, folks at Standing Rock and the group in Canada I was talking about, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, um, are managing um, as well. And I think that those forms of management um, are interlaced with um, Indigenous knowledge and also with, um, you know, kind of an eco-justice attitude. Um, and I also think that, you know, writing and teaching um, about these issues um, is a kind of way of managing the narrative um, about ways that humans can connect um, with different landscapes. And so management, I kind of like to think about it, um, you know, very broadly, um, but eco-justice modes of management um, would definitely be, you know, the kinds of management that I'm trying to promote or trying to say that, you know, they should exist kind of side by side or along with um, these other kinds of scientific land management that we're more kind of familiar with. Thank you. Oh, and the question, the other question, <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention too, so how I came to this project, was that the question? Yes. Yeah, so I, I 
came to this project kind of strangely um, through McTeague. Um, I was working on a seminar paper during my first semester in graduate school, and I was just kind of weirded out by <laughs> McTeague's experience in the desert, um, because first of all, the, the novel McTeague, which I'm talking about by Frank Norris, it was published in 1899. The full title of the novel is McTeague, A Story of San Francisco, but oddly, the novel ends, the last third of the novel um, ends in Death Valley, where we see the main character kind of slowly dying um, and drying out and kind of being overtaken by the desert elements. And I knew that I wanted to write my final paper on the desert scene. Um, and when I started doing research on you know, how other critics had interpreted that scene, I was kind of amazed by the fact that nobody had really taken it on. Um, and when they did write about the desert in their articles, um, they talked about it in these really kind of disparaging terms, like calling it a no man's land and, you know, saying he died and, you know, the desert waste and it's the place where we discard our waste and, um, but nobody was really reading it through an eco-critical lens. Um, and through that paper, I just started researching um, the history of national parks, especially um, national um, desert national parks um, and technical literature related to kind of irrigation, um, and it led me into kind of all of these really cool cultural artifacts that um, wound up kind of weaving themselves throughout um, the rest of the book. And I was initially going to write the entire book just about turn of the century desert spaces in American literature. But the more I researched um, deserts and sand, the more I realized, you know, that this queer sand couldn't really be talked about without also talking about water which you couldn't talk about without talking about infrastructure, <laughs> you know, which you couldn't talk about without also talking about, you know, the people who built the infrastructure. And so it just started um, kind of sprawling out from, from that initial paper about McTeague and the research that I was doing about desert spaces at the 21st or at the turn of the 20th century. That's really fascinating trying to, uh, almost in your work, right, like wrangle an element the same way somebody would try and wrangle the sand outside. Oh. And I often think about, yeah, my writing of the project is, I mean, I know that I critique management <laughs> throughout the book or critique a certain kind of management or a certain kind of attitude towards, um, you know, managing lands, but this project, I mean, I can be self-critical and say, well, <laughs> you know, um, I'm used to doing that, but um, my, my working through the elements in, in all three of these chapters, because I do separate them into, you know, three chapters, there's the sand chapter, the water chapter, and the salt chapter, um, the book itself is kind of organized um, in this kind of taxonomical way where I'm trying to, you know, kind of get close to each element in particular. And so it's my own kind of way of, I mean, the book is structured in a way that kind of reflects my own um, desire to manage, I guess, or understand what these elements meant for people living in those places during that time period. It's definitely kind of a management project, <laughs> what I produce. But I think that inside it, though, uh, there's a performative aspect that does keep that interconnectedness and, and those layers um, more on top of one another than than separate. So I hope so. I yeah. hope. <laughs> At least that's what I was trying to do. But um, I can also see how it can be read the other way as well. But <laughs> we have a question um, from somebody here today that would love to hear more about Jada's interrogation of the life among the Paiutes by Winnemucca. <laughs> So I write about Life Among the Paiutes in the water chapter, and I read Life Among the Paiutes side by side with Owen Wister's The Virginian, uh, because there's a little bit of overlap with um, the environments that both of those authors deal with. And it might seem kind of strange to deal with an indigenous autobiography alongside um, a Western novel <laughs> like The Virginian. Um, but what struck me about both of those works and how I tried to bring them together was kind of the emphasis of both authors on water infrastructure and how, um, you know, kind of their identities, their positionality um, influenced the way that they talked about water infrastructure in the American West. So Worcester, um, Worcester's The Virginian, for those of you who haven't read it, um, follows The Virginian, who's this kind of like hard and, you know, manly Western figure. Um, he works as a se seasonal ditch digger, although we never see him engaged in that kind of labor. Um, and he also works as a ranch hand. Um, he's a man of few words. Um, but in the background, even though we don't see him engaged in, in water labor, we see other individuals kind of in the background, but we don't really get to see them close up. Work is just kind of something that happens in the background of that novel. Um, but in Life Among the Paiutes, there are a couple of really 
um, interesting and compelling um, scenes where we see um, indigenous water laborers, um, specifically on the reservations that were being formed um, in Nevada during that time, Nevada and also parts of Oregon. Um, and she focuses on the fact that the um, that the irrigation, you know, that the dish, ditches and other diversion projects that indigenous laborers were engaged in was actually diverting water from their reservations um, into, you know, kind of other developed areas of, of the U.S. And so water infrastructure, according to Winnemucca, represented a kind of loss, even though, you know, indigenous communities were the ones performing the labor. Um, it was actually kind of like drying up the lands um, for the benefit of those outside of the reservations. Um, whereas in Wister's novel, water labor is really celebrated as sort of the foundation of the country and the infrastructure is celebrated as, you know, sort of a sign of um, development um, and civilization. And so I just really enjoyed reading those two works together, even though it seems kind of strange, <laughs> again, to bring them together for those who have read both of those works, just to kind of see the different ways that you know, race and gender and, and identity, um, ethnicity kind of informs the way that infrastructure, specifically water infrastructure was read at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and at the very end of the novel, um, she speaks directly to the reader and she calls for, you know, sort of this tidal wave of activism. And so we have this water metaphor and you can almost see this wave coming from the Pacific and washing over the entire country. So I found it really compelling too that she used water um, to represent activism and um, you know kind of the kind of movement that was needed to um, you know kind of reclaim what had been lost um, and we see water metaphors being used in similar ways with with movements today I know at Standing Rock um, there are a couple of individuals who I've heard in interviews talk about you know a tidal wave of activism and so water is this kind of powerful force kind of that saturates people and motivates them to engage in the kind of work that you know they feel is necessary. Sorry, that was a really long answer to that question. <laughs> I'm really happy about that. <laughs> we have time for like just a few more questions, I think, um, before we wrap up. And uh, the first one is, can you reflect a bit, just a bit, sorry, because we don't have enough time, <laughs> on the process of writing a book about the desert in the midst of us seeing the effects of this climate change? Oh, that's a really good question. And just in like, briefly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think more than anything, it just, um, I mean, when writing about the desert, you can't help but, you know, kind of pay attention to the way that the elements, um, impact you when you're living in those spaces as well. It kind of just like calls, and I think that that's kind of the power of literature and writing about um, specific environments like desert spaces um, for those who kind of engage in that kind of writing or read about those those kinds of environments. Um, you just kind of, you, it tunes you in a little bit more to those little changes that, I mean, collectively are big changes <laughs> um, brought on by climate change. And so I think, um, for me, the writing has informed my experience in this location since I live in the Phoenix area um, more than the other way around. It's kind of just made me pay more attention to kind of those slight changes that, um, you know, are being brought on by um, the huge mammoth <laughs> hyperobjective event that is climate change or question whether something is, you know, kind of a, um, an effect of that. And so it just kind of makes us more aware of some of those changes or question if it could possibly be one of the a changes, a change brought on by that. Right, like hyper, hyper obje objectivity. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm <laughs> about that in, in a hyper attuned way almost, right? Mm -hmm. the extremities of the desert. Um, our last audience question is, it's both a comment and a question. And this audience member is picking up on something that I also really admired about your talk today. Um, I really like how you mentioned proximity does not equate with control, right? So just because you're near, I think you said, uh, proximity to an environmental problem does not equal mastery of that problem, right? Um, and this is a strength rather than a weakness. Is this a reversal of our current understanding of nature and the elements? How can we begin to transition our understanding of nature? Wow, another really wonderful question. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think proximity grants us a certain kind of understanding of the environment, but I think that we also need perspectives um, 
coming from other places and that represent other kinds of distances um, to kind of come together and create more of a layered understanding um, of a problem or of a location. Um, proximity gives us one kind of vision, um, but sometimes it can prevent us from seeing, you know, some of the effects um, or, you know, things that exist on the periphery that are super important to what that problem is and are maybe creating that problem, but we miss it if we are too focused on one kind of data um, or one element of the problem. Um, so instead, I'm kind of arguing for a situated way of thinking about management where we read different managements um, in different perspectives together um, just to kind of get a more holistic, I guess, vision of, of what these problems look like um, from more than one type of person too. Um, so I think that it goes not just, you know, a question of distance, but a question of who is, um, you know, the one doing the storytelling of, um, you know, what they're experiencing or what they're seeing about that problem or um, of that environment, if that makes sense. It does, I think also they're trying to get at, like, keeping traditionally keeping nature separate from culture. And mm -hmm. maybe part of that discussion is what's being asked in here. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think we're out of time. Um, so I just really want to thank you for joining us and just for a fantastic presentation. I can't wait to get my hands on the book in January. Um, thank you so much, Jada. I'm gonna thank you so much for inviting me to do this talk. I look forward to the other talks that are a part of the series as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Speaking of which, Jada, um, we do have next Tuesday. We hope you'll consider joining us for the final event in the Elemental series this fall. And that is with Marsha Bjornrud from Lawrence University. And it'll be next Tuesday, so a week from today, at 3 p.m. Arizona time. I want to thank once again our ground control team and our live stream expert, Joe Carter, for ensuring our live stream and Zoom webinar went smoothly. And to our audience, I really hope that you've enjoyed this discussion and we'll seek out the Desert Humanities Initiative should you have any interest or projects that you'd like to share with our community. Um, thank you so much and take care everyone.